So hi, uh, I'm uh, Renaud. Uh, I'm a senior developer at EBD Apps, currently contracting at Latitude Financial, who is hiring tonight. So you know, we we do good stuff in both places. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for my voice. I'm just recovering from a week-long hangover from Blast's last day at EDB App, so it's, <laughs> it's been tough. It's been really rough for like a week, but uh, I'm trying my best to, to get through that. Um, I'm <laughs> After Pablo uh, put you in orbit, I mean, that was really, <laughs> really tough, but that's a really tough problem. I, I've, I've wasted days of my life trying to get that working. I'm going to give you a light refreshment. It's a simple idea. It's going to be hopefully really easy to follow. Um, and it basically has to deal with memory leaks. So I personally hate memory leaks. Uh, and I don't know about you. So first of all, I want to do a survey. How many of you test regularly for memory leaks in your applications? Raise your hand if you do. OK, there's like uh, 15, 20% of the room that actually raises their hand. Um, and I don't know about you, but the way I test for uh, memory leaks is that just like, you know, regularly, like once a month, I just launch the app with instruments, uh, t t t testing for leaks, go through some flows, navigate, but go back. Is Swift support to take care of that, or is the memory leak? Swift has memory leaks, and that's what I'm going to show actually in my talk. Like Swift has memory leaks like any other language. Java has memory leaks, any language has memory leaks. You can abandon memory like you, like you want. So. Um, I hate that. I test that manually. It's a bit burdensome. It can be very frustrating because after a month, um, finding a leak and actually finding the root of the leak can be a time-consuming job. And so I was trying to find a better way to do that. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, so memory leaks can be pretty bad because obviously they're, they don't affect your app functionally, but they're bad because you waste memory, obviously, but uh, they decrease cache reuse, which is bad for performance. Uh, they increase uh, um, the probability that your app will be jettisoned in the background because it uses more, um, more memory than it should, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really good to actually make sure that your app behaves as you expect, even though functionally it, it works for the user. Um, so I'm introducing like a really simple app that I wrote, which is nothing compared to what Pablo just presented you. Uh, it's called Counter, and I'm just going to show it to you. <coughs> It's a simple app uh, with a button and a label. It's written using MVVM. Uh, it has a button and a number. And when I click the button, it increases the counter. So great. Uh, I'm ready for uh, App Store fame, and I can ship it to the App Store. It seems like it's working fine. Um, I can show you a bit of the code. I'm going to stop it right there. Um, so it's not delegate, obviously. Uh, like I said, it's using MVVM, so I've got a view controller, very simple. Uh, there's a button, a label. When the button is tapped, I just, I just tell the view model. I use KVO observation to get uh, changes in my view model, um, and that's one way to do it, but right now I'm just using KVO. Um, so you can see very straightforward code. Uh, here's my view model, basically the same thing. I've got a model object tied to my view model, and I just update the counter whenever the button gets tapped, etc. So it just goes through the layer and, and just observes the, observes the change back up. Very straightforward. The app seems to, seems to work like expected, but you know, I go as an extra mile and I write unit tests like, like everybody should. And I did that. So if I go in my test, um, I've got this exit test case, um, which you know, sets up, creates a model, creates a view model, and has one test which tests that when I tap the button, it starts with zero, and I tap twice, and it goes to one and to two. And I run this. And let's see, drum roll. There you go, everything is fine. It works, um, and it, uh, it passes, so great, I can ship. I'm, I'm confident that my app works functionally, and you know, I'm, I'm happy. But am I really? Have I tested everything in my app? And that's my point, which is that have I tested for memory leaks? And can I automate that process to make sure that uh, my app actually frees memory that it doesn't need anymore? And <clears throat> one thing to do, for example, to test that something has been deallocated, one example, one, one uh, solution you can use is you cannot really test that an object has been deallocated, really. Like, there's nothing in foundation or the object runtime that tells you something has been deallocated. But you can indirectly observe that something has been deallocated through the use of a, nil po uh, a weak pointer, sorry. So you can point to something with a weak pointer, and if you read back that pointer and it's nil, that basically means that the object it pointed at was nil. 
And from that, I can basically write a little helper function in my base class, which is uh, my test case, which is uh, just a, a subclass of exit test case. So it just has a bit of customization over exit test case. And uh, if I go in this test class, I can see what I can do, right? I can just create um, an array, basically, of, of weak pointers to objects that I want to check at the allocated at the end of my test run. Um, so it can be done multiple ways. You can create like wrap wrappers that wrap with generics and all of that. But in that case, I'm actually digging into uh, archaeological uh, stratas and basically using NSH table from foundation, which I don't know if anybody knows, but this is a this is a collection from foundation that uh, is like NSH. It has the same function as NSH, but it has behaviors attached to what you put in there. So you can basically say everything that goes into that set. Uh, is, a weak, is weak, basically. You don't retain that, it's, it is weak pointers. And that's basically what I'm doing here. I can create an NSH table uh, of weak objects, so it doesn't retain what gets put in the set, which is great. Um, it's perfect for this use case. So I create that var, this NSH table of weak objects, um, <clears throat> and I have this helper function, which is check for deallocation. Let's add a function where I pass an object and I say, at the end of this test run, let's make sure that this object is deallocated. And so all it does is it adds this object to that NSH table. So it goes into the set, weekly reference, everything is good. Um, <clears throat> and if I then, at the end of the run, I override teardown, and I basically look at anything which is left in that collection. So anything left in that NSH table is basically still an object that is instantiated. If there's anything that still exists in there, that means it hasn't been deallocated properly, and therefore it has leaked somehow. You have a retain cycle, or maybe using manual, manual uh, memory management if you're crazy, but there's something that happened where this object that you expected to allocate at the end of your test has not been deallocated. Uh, very simple, you just iterate over the result and you look at that. So if I had that uh, to my test, and so um, I'm gonna add that at the end of setup, I'm gonna say, by the way, set up everything, but also check for the delocation of my view model. Because at the end of uh, my run in teardown, I'm basically needing out the view model. And if any reference is left, really, um, it, it should be deallocated. If any reference is left to view model, then that means the NSH table will still have a reference to it. So I do this. I run the test again. And I'm running it. And here you go, it's actually failing. It's actually found something, it's actually found that if I go back to uh, my best class, uh, or maybe I can just look at that. Uh, let's see. There we go. Da, IBM. There we go. And it tells me like the object, the view model, blah, 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 at this address was not deallocated. So I've, got, I've automated the fact that I've got some kind of leak, some retain cycle in my view model. I modified the code maybe, and now it automatically detects you've got a problem in your logic. <coughs> and I can look back at my view model, and look at the code and easily find the, the problem here, which is obviously I'm doing an observation and I'm retaining self in my closure uh, block in the observation. So um, the observation, to give you observation at the same lifetime as my object, so I can just basically say that self is unknown. Um, and that should take care of the retain cycle. So I just introduce that fixed. I'm running the test again. And let's see if that fixes the problem. So it's running the test. I go checking that everything's deallocated, and yeah, no, it pa and now it passes, so I fix that return cycle. I don't have to find that out one month later. I have to spend hours trying to find out what change has made it, what, bisecting for like hours on end to find out exactly what made it. No, it automatically captures that. So it doesn't capture everything, it doesn't catch everything, but it captures a lot of the return cycles you can introduce by working on your code. So it's pretty neat. So it's an ID, right? I, I just want to spread the idea of like, why don't you just automate and uh, implement that kind of simple functionality to make sure that your object hierarchy doesn't leak somehow through some code path? Um, and so to go further, right? Like right now I'm doing a, a, a solution which is perfectly fine, uh, but it only works really if you are guaranteed that your object hierarchy, your object graph will deallocate synchronously. You don't have any kind of, you know, what if you use some kind of framework that actually uses dispatch async a bit too much uh, loosely, or you've got some asynchronous process that still holds references and all of that, and you don't, 
you don't have deterministicity. You don't know uh, deterministically whether this object will be deallocated synchronously at the end of your test or not. So how can you work around that? Because you will have a problem here. It may not be deallocated at the end of your test. So even though this is perfectly fine, there's an, there's an even better way, which is um, something that will be able to deal with asynchronicity. So first of all, I want to introduce you to something which is what I call the deallocation sentinel. So it's a simple class that takes a block in its initializer, and when it gets deallocated, it just invokes this block. So basically, it's just a thing that says, hey, I've been deallocated, and you know, I'm invoking whatever you told me to invoke when I get deallocated. It's a very simple uh, thing that somehow is not part of foundation, really should be part of foundation. Um, and I'll go back to my, t my test case, the Swift. And I'm going to show you what it can be like now. <clears throat> So let's look at this now. Um, so instead of using a NSH table of weak references to objects, instead I'm going to build exit test expectation, which is this object that exit test offers that basically says there's an expectation that needs to be fulfilled asynchronously at some point in time. Um, and you can check that they are fulfilled and fail after a certain timeout if they don't, uh, they don't actually check out. But that allows you to test asynchronous code in a very, um, in a very complete and you know, uh, deterministic manner. So I'm implementing this helper function call, called expect the allocation of object. Um, so first of all, let me tell you that you can only check for leaks for reference types, therefore classes in Swift, uh, because structs and value types have different semantics. So really, like, this should only, only be applied to, uh, to reference types. <coughs> in any case. Uh, first thing first, I'm creating, you can instantiate an exit test expectation manually. Uh, I guess a lot of you just create it through the helper functions that exit test case provide, but you can also instantiate it directly yourself. So I'm creating one out of thin air, um, giving it a description which basically talks about what object it is expecting to be deallocated. And then I'm using this funtime.h API, I guess we all dig with funtime.h, objective c anyway. Um, which is obc underscore set associated object. So we are digging into the objective c runtime. And for those that don't know, this API, which is really low level, allows you to associate, like, like link an object to another object and say, I'm going to attach you to that, and you are now part of that. So it's actually a really neat way to add storage to a class you don't control. Uh, it is not recommended, it, it is not performant, but in some circumstances it can be really useful. And for unit tests, it's perfectly appropriate. So it is low level, like I said, and the first argument you pass is basically the object you want to attach something else to. So my object that I want to check for the allocation of. Uh, second thing is you have to pass a, a, a unique key that you can use to later on retrieve the object if you need to. In no case, we don't really need to, but. Um, you got to have some unique key to, to get a handle on that association. Uh, the third argument is basically what, what you want to attach to that object. So in our case, we were going to attach the deallocation sentinel. Um, and because we attach that deallocation sentinel to that object we want to check the allocation of, if that object deallocates, then the deallocation sentinel will also deallocate and invokes a block that says, hey, I've been deallocated. So indirectly, we know that the associated object has been Deallocated. It's a bit, you know, hopefully everybody follows, but it's very straightforward. You're just indirectly seeing that an object has been deallocated because the Objective C, unfortunately, the Objective C runtime doesn't give you that um, that uh, possible that uh, that functionality. Uh, fourth argument is some constant that basically says, like, yes, when you associate that object, retain it. Right? There's a reference here that is held between these two objects. So therefore, when one gets deallocated, this reference gets released, and therefore the object gets deallocated. Um, <clears throat> very powerful, but not recommended to use in your apps, because it's, it's actually pretty slow and all of that. But in that case, it's pretty useful. Uh, and I'm keeping track, I'm keeping reference of that, uh, that uh, exit test expectation in that, that array. And know that I've built this array with my tests. At the end, once again, in teardown, um, so let's say I can replace that, right? I don't need that anymore. I just want to use exit expectation. I can just say, you know what? You're going to wait for um, my array of the allocation expectations. You're going to wait for like one second at most. So if they 
they get fulfilled before one second. It's going to it's going to go completely through. But if you know it three times out, it's going to take a second before it realizes that there's a there's a leak or something like that. But that's totally fine because it's a failure mode. <coughs> And you just write that code, right? There's only like a few lines of code. And I'm going to change that in my view more, uh, my tests once again. I'm going to replace that with expect the allocation of my view model. And because I fixed the problem, it should succeed because there's no problem. We already checked that there's no problem with uh, memory leaks. So yeah, that's expected. And if I reintroduce the bug, Let's say somebody comes in and says, eh, I don't know what this unknown self read does. So I'm going to remove it. And the CI system runs unit tests. And you will see that. There you go. It's going to take a second. There you go. It has failed. And we can see in the log asynchronous wait failed, exceeded time out of one second. We've unfulfilled expectations. We got the description of the, of the object that was not allocated, or at least the expectation that was not fulfilled. And so you can really track, okay, which object on my object graph didn't get deallocated. So once again, fairly simple, fairly simple idea. There's nothing really complex, but it's something that we've implemented at Latitude, for example. It, it's been really neat because it has given us confidence that as we modify the code or refactor it, we don't introduce some arbitrary uh, return cycle. Um, and yeah, so I just want to spread the idea of like, you know what, you can automate most of your uh, memory leak checking rather than do some manual testing once in a while like I used to do. So um, yeah, hopefully you find this idea useful. That's it. Just a quick question around um, using unowned versus weak. Um, is it preferable to use weak? Because if for some reason uh, you, know, you basically self is deallocated, then it's going to crash because it's unowned. Whereas weak, it's yeah. another one. Um, so it's a really small neat pick. Yeah. So we just had actually a mini debate on the Swift channel of the Melbourne Coco has just an hour ago about that. But sure, you can like if you want to play it safe, use weak. That's totally fine. Uh, in my case, I know the life cycle of the observation block. Um, <clears throat> for example, this observation block returns a NS key value observation object which I store in, a, in an IVAR, in a property of this class. And this NS key value observation will be released on the init of that class. Therefore, the life cycle of that observation is tied to the life cycle of the object that, that uses it, of self. So when I see that, to me, at least my personal choice, I prefer to use unknown because it is an indication that's like, no, this is totally safe. Um, so it is not safe at runtime in a way, but it is safe because I say it is. And I'd rather it assert if it's not. I want to know if it's not. But uh, you can also use weak. It's totally fine. Uh, but in my case, like in that specific code, when you know exactly the code path and the way it takes, like you can say, you know what? We, I know. You can use unknown. But that's a bigger debate we can have. But yeah. yeah. <clears throat> in this case, you know that if, if you want it to crash. So. Yes. Uh, I'd rather crash than just say, oh, if it's new, well, I just, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for that. I really like um, the concept of it for keeping this kind of thing in the front of minds of people who are working on the code base. I just have a question around, like, in a more complicated app, how do you decide which objects to put in which unit tests? Because you can't just kind of put everything in, right? You have to make a decision around what goes in and, and not. Yeah. Do you have any guidelines around that, or is that just a kind of thing where, from experience, you know what um, to put in? Or? I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, my opinion is that anything that doesn't touch UI kit should be unit tested. And once you reach the UI kit layers, then it should probably go into an integration test or a UI test and all that. So, <coughs> in my oh, case, I, I, would I don't mean like what should and shouldn't be unit tested. I mean, which objects you should put in oh. this, like, because you, you can't just kind of list all the objects that are instantiated, right? So, Actually, I, I mean, as long as you use, you know, patterns like dependency injection and you don't use singletons too much, for example, right? Like, ideally, everything that is part of the test should be deallocated at the end. I mean, obviously, if you use singletons, then you know, but like, you should know your code and be able to figure out, okay, well, you should know your object graph such that you know exactly what it's testing and that all of these objects are basically ephemeral if that root object gets, uh, gets out. So um, 
yeah, like I don't have a, a recommendation that applies to everything, but you should know your your graph so that you know exactly what needs to only leave during your test. Um, and what I do, for example, like one of the patterns I use is that in setup, I always reinstantiate all my objects. Like in, you can see, right? I recreate my model from scratch. I recreate my view model from scratch. In tear down, I completely tear them down. I don't keep them around. I don't instantiate them once and then reuse them multiple times. I make sure that everything is fresh all the time, which makes that kind of test possible. So I don't know if that helps, but um, ideally, I think that everything should always be free at the end of your cycle. If, you do, if it's not, then something is wrong somewhere. I mean, not deeply wrong, but something sh maybe should be improved in, uh, in the way your app is architected, because ideally, everything should be a, an object graph. Yeah, so, so what you're kind of saying is that everything that you're creating should be added to the test and made sure that it's gone, everything that's created in the code, right? All the objects. Yeah, yeah, to an extent, yeah. Except the, the way we end up using this code is that it's almost always the view models that they yeah. <laughs> Because they're the ones that hold the observables that have all yeah. these closures on them. And it's <coughs> Yeah, no, so, yeah. So Matt is correct, right? So at Latitude, we use Rx a lot. So functional reactive programming makes it very easy to shoot yourself in the foot by having, you know, tons of closures, recent cycles, all of that. So yeah, like, for us, there is a view model is a critical component to test. So yeah, I can't, I can't speak for, for as a broader thing, but definitely at least for, if you have a Rx heavy code base, test your view model because that's where most of your logic should be and that's where most of the risk of introducing a, a written cycle should be. Um, but obviously, view controllers can also leak as well. So I'm sure you could write unit tests that, you know, unit tests, you, you have your controllers. I don't really like them, but, you know, it's doable. And do the same thing. But it's, again, it's up to you. It's, if you find it useful, then you can apply it to more uh, objects. But yeah, you should be aware and uh, yeah, aware of your object draft so that you know that everything gets deallocated at the end of your run. Essentially making sure that no more instances of the model line. Like yeah. I'll, grab, I'll grab the mic for oh. And obviously we're, we're overriding teardown, so make sure to call teardown at the end of your override of teardown, right? Like you, you call setup first, a super setup first, and then you set up your class and the opposite for teardown. So you tear down your level of the hierarchy, then you call teardown of the super class. There's, a, there's an implicit ordering that has to be respected here. Hi. Three well, questions. You know, introduce yourself first. <laughs> nah, who cares? <coughs> who cares? Um, three questions. Second, I, second question I already forgot. First question. Uh, very neat trick with uh, the set associated object. I wonder how well it works for purely Swift classes. I guess they're all also part of the Objective-C runtime, so. Yeah, so I double, almost triple checked uh, last night, but so like I said, they behave very weirdly with value type. So if you try to associate an object on a struct, it's totally happy to do that, but what, they, what seems to happen is that they leak. They never get deallocated. So somehow in the three front time, it doesn't actually work. And that can be understandable because um, value type doesn't really have a life cycle per se. They're values. They don't have a proper life cycle. You can't write a D in it for a struct actually in the first place. So the function accepts it, but after that, you can't really write it, which is why here, I'm saying expect the allocation of object, any object. I force that function to only accept reference types, classes, because Swift, pure Swift classes. So in my code, they're NS objects, and it's gross, I know, but that's because of KVO. Um, but it, it totally works with pure Swift classes. I tried that, so you can absolutely associate an object with a pure Swift class, and it will be uh, deallocated or at least released when uh, that associated object gets released, uh, deallocated as well. It works. 
Have you investigated why that works? As in, is that because pure Swift classes participate in Objective-C runtime as anything else? They can to an object that works. Second question, I remembered it. I have just forgot it. Third question, uh, <laughs> sorry, bad memory. Uh, have, you, have you looked into something a bit more sophisticated and maybe even automated, like some way to even capture the list of initi uh, initialized or allocated uh, objects and then check uh, them, they're all gone? Absolutely, I'm sure there's more advanced things that automate the whole thing and you know, you don't even have to say, by the way, I want to check that. Uh, I haven't gone that far, but I, all I'm interested in is an ID Sure. Uh, which you can do it in not too much, and yeah, you have to like write what you want to see delocated. I'm sure you can do like some swizzling runtime, you know, funtime.h yep. shenanigans to to really like automate that fully. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that's possible. I haven't tried yet. I Maybe guess one day. The only problem that comes to mind is that if uh, some of that some of so, some of your object graph allocates not just allocates memory, but also kind of caches it then that memory stays there and that may cause you know, false positives, right? Yep. Um, that's probably why it may be problematic. I remember the second question. Have you, have you had any problems with uh, the uh, auto-release pools or is it like ARC doesn't use them at all? Um, oh, very good question. I haven't thought about that, but I assume that the first solution I presented with that synchronous object of like weak references will fail because the objects haven't been uh, released by the auto-release pool at the bottom of the stack, if there is. <coughs> Whereas the second one, I don't know actually, that's a good question as well, yeah. That's the second one should be fine actually because you, know, you wait no, for No, because the second. weight doesn't actually pop the stack. Yeah, that'll be so fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yes, that's again, true. It, can be, it can be fixed, I'm sure, very easily. So uh, Maybe, again, I wonder if it's something worth looking into, but maybe what happens is every single test case method is wrapped into an auto-release pool itself. Yep, maybe. It's fair enough, it has a pool where the main thread, which is still running underneath the... Uh, yeah. The, the, sorry, the main run, run which is still running underneath the... Yeah, yes, second, but... The second would be enough to yeah. cross the auto-release pool. You can, you can wrap pools. Yeah, whatever. Okay, cool, thank you. I remember Sean, when he used to program, it was a really long time ago, he used to, he used to do this, um, go through with, um, I'm thinking about an automated way to, to run end-to-end um, -end testing, and you know, more like to run on the app and stuff. Is there a way with Xcode these days to check whether the memory has increased. You know, you push, 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 I remember you doing this so often. Yeah, no, I know. Sorry? Yeah, like, true instruments. Yeah, true instruments. So, this day, can you, can you automate instrument and, and, and check? So you literally run an end-to-end -end testing. You observe the memory usage, and at the end, you should have a really good idea whether you're leaking or not as well. Yeah, so. You know, more, I, mean, I know you need to test how fast and good, but sometimes... I guess you could automate instruments and kind of like yeah, do all of that. Um, there must also be ways to do this kind of logic in UI tests. Mm -hmm. So run the app automated and also instrument the app so that it checks that some of the stuff that gets instantiated in its lifetime gets allocated at the end of the run. Again, I'm just focusing on unit tests right now and I'm sure it's possible in other places as well. It's up to you how much effort you want to put in that. I'm just showing that at least for unit tests, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it doesn't take too long, and you can get already like 80% there to get a lot of the leaks out. And yeah, obviously you're going to miss some, and you can get the, the remaining 20% by really like going the extra mile. But is it worth it? It's up to you to figure out. Yeah.